For the students in the audience, the advice I would give you after having been in the game a little while is to try to buck the herd or buck the trend whenever you can and do something that people aren't doing. Uh, if it's hot and you're just starting out, if it's a hot area and you're just starting out, you should probably move it away, you know, move away from it. Uh, unless, of course, the physics say that something is definitely going to happen, in which case you might want to pay attention. But uh, so in that light, I think Gori's talk uh, you know, sort of bucks the trend of people talking about multi-core and parallel programming. Uh, clearly a lot of important work to be done there, but it was refreshing to hear a different perspective. So I'm going to riff on those themes a little bit in my talk. And, and today uh, I'm going to talk about what, a little bit about what I'm doing in my group uh, for research and what we're hoping to achieve uh, in this group that I've been forming over the past couple of years. So to start out, I think looking forward, there are some really severe disruptions coming up in the next decade. Uh, and while these are predictions, uh, I think there's a lot of evidence to support them. And if any of these predictions are correct, that it means we're going to see some really large shifts. And so in this talk, I'm going to address the first two of the disruptions but I encourage you to think about all four because I think they will have profound implications for the research topics that we ought to challenge. So the first is that uh, multi-core scaling, I believe, is going to end and end reasonably soon. And so uh, I'll, I'll talk more about that, uh, but that has serious implications if you're thinking about moving into an area doing multi-core research because the, it will be different than what people are predicting. Uh, secondly, when that age ends, we'll start to see an age of specialization uh, I've, I've, I wasn't here yesterday, sadly, because I was flying from Geneva, but I've seen Mark Horowitz's talk before, and uh, you know, he's, he's right on the money uh, about efficiency and the degree to which you're going to need to specialize. And this is really going to change a lot of our systems. Let me start my timer here. Uh, so then, at some point in the relatively near future, Moore's Law is going to end. And it, it's closer than people think. I talked to some of the people in the U.S. funding agencies, and they said, well, between 2020 and 2030, Moore's Law will end. And so we need to start thinking about funding programs to think about what comes next. And the answer is it's not going to happen between 2020 and 2030, perhaps for economics reasons rather than physics reasons. Uh, but we may see an end to transition scaling much sooner than people anticipate. Could be five years, might be three, although that's unlikely. Uh, I don't think it won't be more than nine, but I would put my money on five. And then finally, uh, we're starting to see severe depletion in the world's oil resources. I think lots of people in Israel uh, are, are aware of this, but the consequences for how we use energy and the implications for our industry are really profound. And uh, I, I read a lot about this stuff, and, and it's gotten much less press than I think it deserves. So I encourage you all to think about what happens when we have less energy available you know, the year after that we did the year before. And how can information technology help address that all of the very serious implications of that uh, phenomenon. So the multi-core era, as some people calling, are calling it, uh, really started to, to pick an arbitrary date in about 2004 when uh, Intel made a, a decision to shift. And obviously, there's no one date that you can say this was it. But this is as good a date as any. And what I define as the multi-core era is the era in which we keep scaling the number of cores roughly proportionally to the number of transistors. So 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, and so on and so forth. Obviously, we will be able to build chips with many more cores. Uh, people will build many chips with many more cores for certain domains. But the question is, as the primary driver of performance and efficiency and capability growth, uh, the multi-core era is going to end sometime reasonably soon. And so I, I put up here on the slide a few uh, comments or statements that I believe are true about the end of this era. So number one, we'll see diminishing returns from adding to the number of cores uh, in general, which will mean that it won't make sense to add more in the next generation. Uh, we will always have multi-core chips. I'm by no means claiming that the number of chip cores will shrink back down to one. Uh, there's a question about which sort of programming model do we use, parallel or sequential. We'll use a mix of both, as Guri said. Uh, so I'm not claiming that multi-cores will go away, just that they'll cease to be the primary driver of scaling. Uh, once you see that diminishing returns, we won't see them as a driver for more transistors. We'll need to figure out what else to do with those transistors. And that is a huge open question uh, that we'll get into my discussion about specialization. 
There's certainly value in parallel programming. There's more value in sequential programming. But uh, you know, when, the, when this era ends, if you have an application and you figure out how to better extract more parallelism, whether through better algorithms or explicitly parallel programming, or sequential programming that, under, that, that exposes the parallelism, there will certainly be value in that, and people will be highly motivated to do that. We will need either asymmetry or dynamic capabilities uh, in, in these multi-cores, uh, even at that point, because one size won't fit all. Uh, but it won't be the major driver. Uh, I don't see this as a parallel revolution. This was a 10-year, in some sense, experiment of desperation to find out how to use these transistors and keep getting gains. Uh, it really hasn't changed the way that computer science operates. Everyone is not writing parallel programs right now. Uh, when this started, people said we need to reform our curricula so everyone writes only in parallel. And that's just not happening. The industry is too big. There's too much legacy software. There's value in it, to be sure. Uh, and there's a lot of incentive to do it. But we really haven't seen this fundamental shift uh, towards everything being parallel. And we're out of time. Uh, listening to Justin's talk this morning, we have four years, you know, when the design team starts and, and to, to crank through that. That means that we're working on the designs right now that will be instantiated in somewhere between you know, 15, 14 nanometers and 11 nanometers. Uh, and we really just don't have time right now, given what's coming and how fast it's coming, to shift to new models and say, let's, let's create a new parallel language and it will be ready and widely deployed and people will be trained and they'll be able to use it by 2015. That just isn't going to happen. It takes a decade or more uh, for new programming languages and new parallel programming models to get widely adopted. So, so that's not going to save us. So we have a paper coming up that we'll present uh, next Wednesday called Dark Silicon and the End of Multicore Scaling in ISCA. And I just wanted to, uh, to talk a little bit to the, con the conclusions in that paper because I think they're going to drive uh, a lot of these phenomena that what I talk about. So I, wanna, I don't have time to go through the whole thing, but what we did in the paper is effectively we took device scaling and took two scaling projections. One was the ITRS, the Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors, and what are they predicting? And it's really a guideline or targets for industry to hit. They have very optimistic scaling projections for supply voltage, uh, leakage, doping. I mean, the, they're, they're assuming great new materials are popping up every couple of years for the the transistor gates. So they, in some sense, are the wild optimists. And then we have a much more uh, balanced, conservative set of projections that line up with what some of my friends in industry have been telling. Uh, and then what we do is we take those, those two uh, technology scaling models and then couple them with a, with a curve scaling models. And what we did is we took, at a given process node, we collected a large number of power slash energy and performance numbers from different processors and fit a Pareto curve to that set. So trading off energy versus performance and say, what's the, what's the boundary of how much performance you can get for how much energy? And then we fitted a function to that curve, and you can see that curve, that curve here as an example, okay? And with the best cores on this line, and of course over here is better. And, and what we tried to do is said, okay, this, this is, you know, you're not gonna do better than this curve uh, for a given you know, set of processors that we see. So let's bring that into the model, and then let's, Let's look at different multi-core models architecturally, so symmetric, asymmetric, dynamic, and composed or fused, looking at both CPU-like organizations and GPU-like organizations. And then some applications, both abstracted and real, and we use the Parsec benchmarks. And then we tie all of this stuff together into one large model to see how much benefit uh, for a fixed power budget do we get out of scaling the number of multi-cores. So we can, we can survey the entire multi-core space, number of cores, size of the cores, uh, capabilities of the cores, organization of the cores, and come out with, for each workload, the optimal multi-core configuration, and then at each technology generation, see how much we get out of that. Okay, so it's really an attempt to say, how much juice is there left in our current set of designs and, and multi-cores for a set of parallel applications? And what we, what we found out was, sort of lining up with, with my intuition was that the, the amount of juice left obviously depends on your assumptions. Uh, but what I'm showing on this graph is a speed up number here, which I'll call target. It's, and, and over 10 years, we got about 18x uh, at a fixed power budget. And this is actually the last 10 years of gains shifted forward. So this is saying, this is what we did in the last decade. 
And how do we line up with multi-core scaling going forward? What do we get? And so uh, for symmetric designs, where every core looks about the same, you know, remember, this is an idealized study with optimistic assumptions. So in some sense, for a given technology model, this is a guaranteed not to exceed number. Uh, we see uh, about a 3.4x gain in 10 years, which is actually a very small annual compounded growth rate in terms of performance. I don't believe that this is enough to justify the sort of uh, core scaling approaches that we've seen. Uh, now, if you take that and you go to an asymmetric design, you do a little bit better. You get a 3.5x instead of a 3.4x. Uh, and if you go to a dynamic topology, uh, you get about a 3.5x as well. And then if you go to something that does composition or fusion where you can dynamically merge cores sort of at an ideal level, this is like core fusion or the composable lightweight processors work we did back in 2007, you get a 3.7x gain. So again, optimal multi-core topology with lots of sort of fairly aggressive mechanisms being able to merge and split cores dynamically. Uh, what that really says to me is that there's much less gain left than there has been in the past. And so we need to look to something else to provide that gain. Okay, now just as a last comment, uh, that was using the conservative technology assumptions here. Uh, and these, again, are for the Parsec parallel benchmarks. And so both the blue line with conservative assumptions and the red line with the ITRS optimistic assumptions, you know, obviously give you a bigger gain, 8x instead of, uh, you know, a notch under 4x. Uh, and these dotted lines here show you that uh, what happens if you have an application that's 99% parallel. So it's an idealized application, you know, Amdahl's law, it only has a... 1% serial portion, which is very, very, very good by even today's parallel benchmark standards. And, uh, and it's up here. If you, if you do hit the ITRS parameters and we get really good, in some sense, uh, very optimistically good performance scaling and you have an almost perfectly parallel application, then you start to get speed ups that we've seen at historical rates. And that can justify scaling up the number of cores. But it's going to take all those things to hit you know, in the next two, four, eight, six years. Uh, for that to scale. Okay, so un unless that wonderful situation occurs, we're, we're just not going to get that much additional use out of multi-core scaling. And remember, that's for parallel benchmarks, okay? So an alternative is to go to specialization and try to run more efficiently. And this was the, the subject of Mark Horowitz's talk. And I won't, you know, th this slide largely captures what he was talking about, which is the general purpose processors are in this range in terms of efficiency on a log scale and dedicated fixed function blocks, three orders of magnitude better. And then there's, you know, DSPs and sort of domain-specific processors sit somewhere in the middle. And right now, for most codes, we're down here. If you know exact, if you only want to run thing and you can afford the NREs to design something, you run up here. The question is, how do we get from here to here uh, to continue justify the sort of performance gains now that we're energy and power limited going over the next decade? But this leads to what, what I call the, con the customization conundrum which is one of these iron triangles like memory hierarchies, uh, which I learned from Gurry back in uh, you know, 1991 or two when I took his class at Wisconsin. And really, you, know, you can have high volume uh, and, uh, and very high NREs, you know, but if you want efficiency, you might need to specialize. That's going to limit the volume, and that's going to mean your aggregate NREs go up. So what we really want is systems that are highly specialized, but run over large numbers of applications and we don't have to pay very much to design them. And right now in our current model of design methodology and our current economic models for how we produce chips and how we sell them in the markets, it's very hard. We, we don't actually get all three. You know, Intel tries to make their general purpose systems as efficient as possible by having you know, just insane NREs because they know they're going to sell them into so many different units. So going forward, as we specialize chips, the question is, how can we do that over a much broader range of applications, uh, given that the chips are specialized to get more efficiency? That's one of the fundamental challenges we're going to face over the next 10 years. OK, so given that, if we're here, what do we do in the pulse multicore aura, uh, era? So one, one alternative is that we just start building lots of accelerators. And I'll call these fixed fun function accelerators, things like you know, video codecs, uh, AES, TCP offload. And every time we double the number of transistors, we double the number of fixed function accelerators. That leads to something that Chuck Moore has called the Franken chip, where you've got you know, thousands of fun fixed function accelerators 
and only a small fraction of them are on at any one time because of this dark silicon phenomenon. Uh, you, you might be able to do better if you, if you can do very rapid prototyping and look at your application and say, here's a small set of fixed function accelerators that I need for this application, and you send that off to the factory, and a few weeks later you get back a chip that is designed to a standard pinout. But again, we don't have the NREs right now to do a chip like that are way too high. Lots of people working on, on improving that. So, so this, you know, we'll continue to use fixed functions when there's something that everybody uses, but I don't see this as a viable method going forward to, to draw, really drive what we're doing you know, in the industry and drive the need for more transistors. Secondly, we can just use more programmable accelerators. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. And this is a direction I think is, is really promising. And third, we can just say, well, we're going to bail out on the whole dark silicon thing and we'll just shrink our chips exponentially with feature size so that we can power the whole chip and deal with the power density. And your chips start to shrink and eventually vanish to the naked eye. Um, that's hyperbole. Uh, but what that leads you to is chips that don't have a lot more capability. There are just many more of them. And so the demand for those chips, because they may not be that much faster than the previous generation, isn't very high and the supply explodes. And so that does very clear things to the price of the chips. And that may be an opportunity for the consumer, but maybe not an opportunity for the producer. And so I think this is why uh, many of the volume silicon producers are investing enormously in this Internet of Things direction. Uh, and Justin alluded to some of that in his talk, where uh, you know, there's, there's chips in everything because they're so darn cheap. That's another viable direction. The question is, will the economics support it, and will we be able to continue scaling? So for programmable accelerators, uh, there's a number of classes, and I've broken them down into four classes. Uh, and actually, my, my group is working on all four to, to varying degrees and capacities. There's GPUs. Everyone knows what those do. There's FPGAs. Everyone knows what those do. Uh, those, when you have an application that maps nicely down, works really well. The problem is that GPUs and FPGAs, you know, to really squeeze a lot of the work out of them right now, take enormous amounts of programming effort. Uh, you, know, you can get some with automated tools, but getting a, getting a really, really large speed up takes very skilled programmers. We need to reduce the effort to extract efficiency and parallelism uh, and specialization from those parts. <coughs> I'll, I'll claim that many core chips, you know, like Tylera's design or other designs that we see going forward, physics processors, uh, you know, a thousand very, very lightweight slow cores are also a form of programmable accelerator. They're not general purpose. Um, they are, uh, but definitely will play a role here when you can use them. And, you know, Mark Hill had a paper recently in our, our analysis in our upcoming ISCA paper has shown that you really want the capability to use a dynamic multi-core to merge and split them uh, so that you, you can adapt these many, many cores to the needs of your workload. And so uh, that's something that we're also working on. And then there's a fourth class that I'll call approximate architectures, where you've, you're, you're in some sense allowing the, the computation to produce an imprecise result uh, on an, on, for numeric, numeric programmed applications, not just you know, an, an analog circuit that, uh, that you've done the analysis for as a fixed function part. And you can play games there on the electronic margins. You, know, you, you just cut down on your, on your band gap, uh, occasionally get an error looking at analog accelerators or neural networks. All of those, I think, can provide big gains in efficiency at the cost of some precision of your results. And I think that's a very promising direction to, to, to look at going forward. OK, so, but given that we, uh, I believe that we're going to need to specialize, as computer architects, it's very hard to specialize. You can work on these abstract, you know, programmable accelerators. But without knowing what you're targeting, it's, it's very hard to know how you should specialize your design. Uh, and so when thinking about this talk, I, I looked at the work my group is doing and tried to organize it into a, a set of specialization targets. And so here, I think, are four very interesting directions. And all, all these are consistent with some of the themes that Justin listed in his talk for, uh, for specialization. So you know, given, given sort of finite resources and energy, how do we build applications that make the rest of the economy much more sustainable? We're already doing that but I think we need to push it much farther. We do it for transportation, traffic analysis, things like that. Let's do it for reusing resources. Let's do it for shipping goods. Uh, we, we really need to build the, build the infrastructure and applications to cut way down on the amount of, the energy, of energy that the rest of the economy uses. Uh, something that I'll call continuous user interfaces. I'll talk about that momentarily, but it's, it's really a next class of user interfaces 
sort of like when we moved from, from text to graphic user interfaces, uh, something I'll call extreme personalization. This is having, and again, this comes back to the context discussion that Justin had in his talk, of having web services that are, that are individually tuned for you as a person, uh, that know your behaviors, your preferences, your moods, your context, all of those things. And akin to when we moved from mainframes to personal computers, right now we have services, web services, that are really monolithic services. Uh, I believe we are moving to an era where those services, many of them will be highly personalized. And so that requires uh, actually a fair degree of specialization in the underlying hardware because the requirements of doing that across a large population are very large. And then finally, and this is maybe uh, related to this, what, what people are now starting to call big data, which is just this enormous amount of data we have in the cloud, whether it's from sensors or uh, consumers or it's data that's mined or data that are stored, really traversing those data and, and running machine learning models across them and doing classification and clustering and try to infer either semantic knowledge or facts or trends or clusters from, that, from those data uh, is becoming increasingly important. And, and we're learning things from those data that we didn't know a priori. We're getting surprises. This is valuable both in science and in commerce and in medicine uh, and entertainment even. So that's another place where I think there's a lot of interesting research to be done for specialization. So let me talk a little bit about what, what my group is doing. Uh, so if you look, I, I left off the, the mini computer era, although you, you could call say that's an era. Uh, but really, I broke this down into four and maybe five, depending on how you think of minis, eras, you know, mainframes, PCs, internet, which really is different from PCs uh, because it, it drastically broadens the range of things you can do with a PC, and then the move to mobile computing and having the internet and all these services in your pocket. You know, if you note, these, these eras have actually, in some sense, been accelerating. Uh, or at least they've been coming very quickly, and this is not the last one. So the question is what, come next? what comes next? And so something that we're working on uh, post these first four waves is something I call the continuous era, where you are continuously connected to online services. Your context is being mined. You're getting notifications. You're continuously interacting with both the world as augmented by information uh, and by online services. Now, obviously, this has to be done in a tasteful way so that it makes you more productive, not less, and it's more pleasurable to use, not less. We don't want constant interrupts coming in every five seconds and distracting you, uh, although you could argue that's what SMS is. But uh, we're really trying to get to something here where uh, you know, you're part of an ongoing conversation and you're interacting with things on a continuous, not a discretized basis, for example, every time you pull your phone out of your pocket. And so these require increasingly natural user interfaces. Again, this is, you know, I felt like Justin was giving a, uh, uh, I won't say a different version of this talk, but it had a different perspective. But a lot of it, were, it was interesting how uh, parallel a lot of our thinking was. Tighter integration of you with computation. And then back in the cloud, rich personalized services, making your user interface better and, and, and mining information and figuring out what you need to be aware of, what your context is, and providing uh, richer services for you. So what does the system architecture look like for this? Well, you're, you're likely to have a device on your body, one or more. We already have at least one if you carry a cell phone. Uh, it may be more, it may not. That remains to be seen. Uh, a room device providing additional analysis about your context and, and information. That may be optional. Um, an area server that can provide you computation and results and data with low latency. And then a data center sitting far off you know, across the continent that has enormous amounts of information and computation and maybe doing lots of mining on these big data sets. And all of these play in this hierarchy. You can think of this as physical proximity is here and size of, of data set is here. And there's just a trade-off among these in the hierarchy. You know, right now we, we often just use these two points at the end. Uh, but I see this spectrum getting richer. You know, the latency to, to access the service grows as you move right. The energy efficiency that you need has to improve as you move left. Uh, and, and so that's the trade-off. And we really ought to be thinking about this distributed system when architecting an integrated service and then asking as computer architects, what are the specialized pieces that we need to build to make all of this happen and work well and work efficiently? So if you think about the services that these provide, the body device you know, needs to be instantly responsive. It needs to have a sophisticated user interface so it's, uh, it's pleasure to use. 
this, the room device, in some sense, needs to be aware of what's going on in the room, and it needs to foster your interaction with your mobile device. The area server here, you know, this could be a data center box coupled with a cell phone tower. It could be a server sitting in, you know, it could be your home PC, a server sitting in the building, but needs to provide you services with very low latency, and then there's this massive thing sitting behind it that's doing analysis and shipping the results to be cached on these three devices at varying degrees. So what I've been working on for the past year or so is building up uh, a model and a team that tries to build out an architected, a single experience or set of experiences that's, that's architected over this whole stack. And so if we take a slightly different view of it, uh, you, at, the, at the very bottom you have both the client and the data center hardware. Then you've got some, uh, some system components, things like your cache manager, the thing that, that uh, interacts with the data center and the services on behalf of you that's running on your client device, your mobile device, your phone or other. Then there's the application layer that's providing you interesting services. You know, at the top of this, there's a unified user experience that's, that's facilitated by both of these stacks, applications running in the cloud over some infrastructure running across the data center, storage managers, uh, runtime models, things like that, what people call middleware, and then hardware at the very bottom. And so I, I don't have time to go through all of it today. I'll go through some pieces. Uh, the NCs are no comment, and these are things that I think are, are uh, a little bit too proprietary to discuss. But we are publishing uh, pieces of this. We had a paper in ASPLOS last year on pocket cloudlets, an augmented reality application I'll show you an, an example of. And then we have a system, uh, a, a back-end augmented reality uh, remote rendering service that we built in the cloud. And then something called Aura, which holds your data and mines it for these rich personalized services, uh, running machine learning models across it on your behalf, running as, as infrastructure in the cloud. So I'll start with Aura, and I'll do one, one or so slide on each in the interest of time. Maybe I'll jump ahead here. Um, right, so the, the idea behind this Aura system that we're building is to really balance uh, privacy and rich services and to provide both. So one of the scary things about the world we're moving into, if we don't handle privacy co correctly, is when people talk about, you know, the system knows your context, uh, and again, Justin said this as well, if that leaks, it's incredibly damaging. And we're, we're already undergoing an incredibly bad loss of privacy. There was a recent study looking at Facebook where they took a picture of somebody, you know, ran that picture across a mined Facebook set to find the person, looked at their hometown and birthday, and if you're in the U.S., they can get the, guess their social security number to with a fairly high degree of accuracy. You know, those sorts of things are really terrifying, uh, and things are just getting worse. So what we're trying to do is build a system that really holds all of your data inside, and the services come inside and run inside on your behalf and aren't allowed to leak out. So rather than sending your whole purchase history to a company, the, you'd hold your, person, your purchase history inside your aura, your digital extension in some sense, and the company will ship its model to you and run it across your data locally and then send you recommendations. Okay, so the, the intent there is to, is to really preserve your data inside this thing and let services run inside on your behalf without sending data back to a, a third party whenever possible. Obviously for sharing and some services there needs to be communication. And that boundary is a real research challenge. Um, but I think we have to go to a model like this eventually. And especially if we're going to go to one of these rich continuous user interfaces, people, you know, you need a service that knows what your preferences are, what you think is important, when you want to be interrupted, what your context is, what you're doing. So if you're driving and, you're, and your significant other needs to talk to you, you probably don't want to take the call on the highway. You want to take the call as soon as you, as soon as you park. Um, but if there's an emergency, you might want to take the call when you're driving. So the system needs to know whether or not you're driving and whether or not it's an emergency and what your preferences are. And this is not something I want to give to outside companies. And I can give you another example. Uh, you know, if you think about location-based services and accelerometers and your cell phone in your pocket, if it's sampling your accelerometer, sampling your GPS, sampling your location, sending that up to some service you don't own, imagine that you're in your car and you take an illegal, illegal left turn and your insurance rates go up. You know, imagine if you've been sitting sedentary for too long, too many days in a row, and your health insurance rates go up. I mean, these are the sorts of things that are coming if we don't do something about it. So I won't get on my high horse. Um, and then as, as part of this, uh, services run within your aura. We call them aurons. Actually, we call, uh, if you're a Lord of the Rings fan, we call malicious aurons, saurons. Uh, and stupid aurons are morons. But, uh, 
No, we, I could go on, but I won't. Um, but th this is really a different application model that we have on our mobile phone right now, where right now you get an app and you have this siloed vertical that can access its data, maybe some of your phone sensors depending on its priorities, and then it communicates with a, a service owned by somebody else. Uh, but, they don't, but these applications aren't siloed, and you really want them to work together. And so in, in this world, what we've done is these Orons are, in some sense, mobile apps that are running in the cloud or on your mobile device. They, they can migrate back and forth, but they act as filters and communicate with other Orons. And so you build these data flow graphs of communicating apps that filter data, infer context, learn things. You can import them, provide more information, uh, but they all run within your private data store. And then the security model and privacy model uh, prevents them from leaking data outside. Okay, so then we had a, a, a paper last year called Pocket Cloudlets, and you know, here the, the observation is that for UI and for services, you want really, really low latency much of the time to have a great user experience. I think as part of a continuous interface, uh, you need to run a lot of stuff on your mobile device, but you don't have access to all of the data uh, you know, that, that are sitting in the cloud. And so what we did is we built a, a uh, caching and storage manager on the mobile phone that we call a Pocket Cloudlet. And what it does is it takes a big chunk of, or a, a chunk of the data sitting in the cloud uh, and brings it down you know, at night when you're plugged in, you know, when, you're, when you're running over a hard wire, caches it, and then runs a cloudlet service where it imports the service on your local device. And then, of course, it, if, you, if the service doesn't have the data it needs, it'll have to run up to the, the global device. And we, tried, we actually picked a fairly demanding application, mobile search, uh, and then cached a chunk of the web search index on your mobile phone, actually just a few hundred megabytes worth, and, uh, and a, a local search manager and found that about 70% of the time you can actually serve up your search from your mobile device uh, without going to the data center. So four milliseconds response for your search instead of four seconds. And then the other 30% of the time you need to go to the, the data center. It provides a qualitatively different user experience and this is a model that we're building on for a lot of these other services designed to support a continuous user interface. Uh, we have a, a recent result with a paper under submission where we actually do this for web pages and freshness, and we found with a very small amount of machine learning and your, your request history uh, and your context, you know, time of day, what pages you reference when, we can actually give you a local hit on your, on your web page cache 90% of the time with a freshness within five seconds without sending very much data between the uh, server you know, and, the, uh, and the phone. You know, in some sense, the server will anticipate almost exactly when you're going to want to access certain pages and then pre-send pre those down so that they're very fresh. Um, and it just illustrates the power of how well your system can understand you and your patterns and your history and your needs on a very, very fine time scale if it knows enough about you. But again, you need something to keep all that private because the thoughts of it, all that leaking out to, to third parties to me are actually really terrifying. And then I guess the last thing uh, that I'll cover as part of this is the user experience side. So we've talked about you know, the, the, the store for your personal information and an app model that supports that, uh, and then some system software running on, the, on, the, on your mobile device that integrates with this stack. Uh, and then here, we built out a system to support augmented reality using remote rendering. And so, uh, you know, there's augmented reality is a really hot area. I think it's going to be a bigger market than internet advertising. Uh, and so it's, it's really taking off. And so in some sense, it's a battleground among many companies. And the key idea is that you have a mobile phone or a mobile device or some, some screen interface that's personal, and it, it figures out where it is relative to the world. So it computes what's called a pose matrix, sort of looks at where it is relative to you know, the third seat from the left in the audience. And, uh, and that may be based on analysis of the scene generated by the camera. That may be based on markers that have been put on the chair. That's a little bit easier. Uh, if you have that, and, and then it will insert virtual objects into your field of view, okay, and try to pin them to the view that you see based on its computations about where it is relative uh, to the thing that it's augmenting. And that needs to be very precise, and you need to update that very fast, because you can be moving around very quickly, and the pose matrix is constantly changing. So what we did is said, let's try to build some really, really rich experiences that will support this notion of a continuous user interface uh, using things that are rendered in the cloud. And so we'll compute the pose matrix locally from your phone, ship that off to the cloud, render something, ship it back just in time to be seen. Uh, and I'll show you a video after I talk about the architecture. So we call this Romar for remote, remote 
object M, I don't remember what the M is for augmented reality. Uh, and so you have the phone, just, you take the camera image, you compute where you are relative to, in this case, this sheet of paper that has markers on it. You send that matrix, which is uh, not shown here, because the color's off to the cloud. It does some graphical rendering of some object or physics-based scene, uh, does some physics calculations, generates a video based on that, uh, or the next frame of the video, compresses it, sends those frames back in a stream to your mobile device, and then that's composited with the camera image. For those of you that work in the field, I'm sorry for the, the overly uh, uh, general uh, discussion. And then that's shipped to your screen so you can see the composite image. So I have a short video here uh, that I'll play. And I'll talk you through the video as it, as it goes. So this is an Android device with a sheet of paper here. It's tracking the sheet of paper. And then the phone is rendering these very simple Rock'em Sock'em robots. Uh, you know, so it's a, and you can have them punch by touching the screen. So uh, I'll show you first what we do with a single view uh, using this sheet of paper with markers on it, and we're working to eliminate the markers. So I have uh, Ju Young here on my team. He's holding a mobile device. Uh, this is a Windows 7 slate with a camera mounted on it, uh, pointing at the, at the, at the uh, sheet of paper here, and the cloud is rendering the stack of blocks here and the shadow coming off of it. And you can see it's, it's rendered, and as he's moving around, uh, you know, it's pinned to the underlying sheet. So all this is being done by a machine sitting in another room in real time. So what you can do now is because this is being rendered in the cloud, you can have multiple people viewing the same scene. Uh, and, and so the same system here is doing uh, multiple renderings. And so you see Bill and Ju Young here are now seeing the same scene and shooting blocks uh, at this, at this uh, set of towers and all of the physics simulation of those blocks is being done in the cloud in real time, and they're able to see the scene. Now, if they point at each other, you'd see the blocks shooting out of their, lap, of their little slates, which is kind of fun. Um, but I think the point here is that you can do very, very rich images, uh, you know, whether it's medical applications, gaming, or whatnot, uh, using this cloud infrastructure, providing some really compelling and very interesting uh, experiences on the user side. So on the, uh, on the client side here, you know, if you look at the end-to-end -end latency to do this, 10 milliseconds is, is more or less sub-perceptual. Uh, 100 milliseconds starts to hit your threshold of awareness, and you know, 100 is really too slow, and you really need to do something in 16 if you want to render at 16 frames a second. Uh, let me go back here. And so I've shown here the, the pipeline we have in, in what we've built, you know, about 9 milliseconds for tracking, 7 for rendering in the cloud, video encoding, then 30 milliseconds for decoding on the client, and then compositing with the display takes about 10 milliseconds. Now this is assuming that the machine is in the next room. Uh, if you're going to a data center halfway across the world, that's going to add a lot of latency. And so hence that hierarchy that I talked about with you know, in-room machines, with a connect camera maybe, uh, then you know, a local server for doing low latency computation, and then your far off data center for big data sets. I, I think we'll start to see that sort of distributed infrastructure. But if, if there was ever a candidate you know, for some fixed function devices on the client, you know, these would be, these would be those. You know, you push that stuff into hardware, take that, you know, decode stuff time down to two, uh, and people have certainly done this, but this is the sort of work that I think that informs your end end experience about what you should specialize. Because if you get that down, you can make it really quick. So I've shown you here another picture where we're rendering a rich medical image, uh, you know, a 3D volumetric uh, model of a person, and you can go, you know, you can go in and out of layers real time, this data sets you know, multiple gigabytes, uh, and it's, it's, you know, sitting there on your desk, and you can walk around it with your slate in 3D and look at it. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of challenges here. How do you handle occlusion? You know, you need a little depth camera to see where things are so that they know what to, what to occlude and what not to occlude. If you, if you want to get rid of the marker, you need some really sophisticated tracking algorithms. Uh, you know, if you have a lack of support for an alpha channel, you need to send two streams, and the network latency is a big issue. All of these things require hardware specialization to make them really fast and really efficient and continuous uh, in a fixed energy budget. And so there's a lot of work to be done here uh, in building these, uh, these advanced experiences and supporting them in hardware. Okay, in the interest of time, I'll st skip over our uh, talk about our, our E2 architecture work. Um, and I'll just conclude uh, by saying that, first of all, exponentials are not forever. So uh, one of the things I, I disagreed with in, in the previous, some of the previous or one of the previous talks was this uh, talk about how things go on forever. I mean, you, you go on until the market or physics no longer let you. 
Uh, and by market, I mean economic limits. And so, for example, cars got a lot more efficient, a lot faster for a while, and then they flatlined for decades. Uh, you know, we may see the same thing with information technology. You know, planes don't fly appreciably faster now than they did decades ago. So, you know, technology moves forward in sort of fits and starts in different unpredicted dimensions, but it's not like any one technology just keeps going forever. And so taking a previous exponential and extrapolating it arbitrarily far to the future, I think that's what Ray Kurzweil does, and I, I really disagree with that. I think it's a very dangerous thing to do. Um, so I actually think that our efficiency scaling and technology scaling is coming to an end reasonably soon, and we're going to need to do things at the architecture level and the specialization level to continue moving our capabilities forward. Uh, there's a huge opportunity in new user interfaces, given all this information, all this context, the size of the data sets that we have, and I think it's really exciting to, to, to mine those for different sorts of information and see how those nuggets of information that you extract from that can be used to provide more interesting services to people. Uh, I think the architecture community, uh, our community, for, or at least a portion of it is going to need to embrace some new apps and start thinking about system design rather than component design. And, and people are already doing that. I think there needs to be more of it. And uh, you know, when CMOS scaling ends and we have these billions of transistors on a chip, that's really when architects have the sandbox to play in where it's our job to make things better and we can no longer rely on the process curves to give us a free lunch every two years. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions.